Hello, this is Professor David Bishai. This is part B of our lecture on health worker labor supply. And in this section, we're going to cover some theory of the firm and apply it to physicians as firms to understand more about their objective function. So let's go back over the theory of the firm. A profit maximizing firm maximizes a profit function which is made up of revenue minus cost. To maximize that, they will put in a functional form where revenue is the units produced, y, times the price of y, and the cost is their cost of the inputs, the wage times the amount of labor required, and the rent times the amount of capital required. They have to maximize that profit, but there's going to also be a production function for y, which is made out of L and K. We say y is a function of labor and capital, where the little f is the name of the function, so we say f of L and K. When the profit maximizing firm maximizes profit, they try to maximize the profit function and they derive answers to two questions. How much product should they make? What is the optimal amount of output Y star? That optimal amount will be a function of wage, rent, and the price of the final output. Look clearly. It is Look closely. It's a function of prices like wages, rents, and the price of the output. That's the only thing that matters for the optimal output supply. This is their supply function. The profit maximizing firm also develops two input demand functions to, to guide them in choosing how much of the inputs to purchase. Their demand for the input of labor will depend on first their solution to the optimal supply of Y star and prices. Their solution to the optimal amount of capital will depend upon the solution to the optimal supply Y star as well as wages and rents. So that's the algebraic version of their their problem. If we <clears throat> want to put this in graphical terms, we would look at a grid of two inputs, input 1 on the horizontal axis and input 2 on the vertical axis. Because input 1 and input 2 have to be purchased out of some funds, they would have some type of a price relationship across these red lines where these are total cost constraints. If you have $10 to spend, you can spend your $10 of of money for your firm, 100% on input 1, this point here where the red li um, line hits the horizontal axis is where the total cost is $10 and they're spending it all on input 1. Alternatively, they could spend it all on input 2 where the red line hits the vertical axis on, on the, the, the red diagonal line hits the vertical axis. Or they could spend it somewhere in the middle. If they wanted to spend $20, there's these red straight lines of t combinations that add up to $20 spent on the inputs, and $30, and so on, all the way up. Every time they expand, they can afford more inputs under their budget. The red lines give us both the total amount that they have to run their business, as well as reflecting the, the relative prices between input 1 and input 2. There is an engineering relationship between how much output this firm can make as it combines input 1 and input 2. And these isoquant curves are red lines of the combinations of input 1 and input 2 that are all associated with the exact same amount, amount of the output. So all combinations on this bottom output isoquant isoproduct curve are going to give you 50 units of output. And the second one above that, all of the combinations of input 1 and input 2 lead to 100 units of output, and so on, all the way up this three-dimensional mountain. Think again that there is a mountain peak coming out of the, the northeast side of this, this graph with a very high peak of, of output. And so the job of the firm is to try to climb this output mountain by keeping costs at a minimum. And these would occur at points of tangency between the ISO cost lines and the ISO product curves. 
and I've given you these three red dots, but there are an infinite number of dots which all depend on how much uh, spending money the firm has to run its business every year. That spending money comes from the revenue it's going to generate by selling these outputs on the market. So if it has a, a large market, it'll try to sell 150. If it has a small market, it'll sell 50. And all of these points are minimum cost points, and they're all going to help this firm compete with its competitors and stay in the market. The firm should be ready to change. If something changes in the prices of the inputs, these slopes will change. And I've shown you a picture now where input one is now relatively less expensive than input two. And because of this, the firm will say, well, it's better to buy more of input one and go to the black dots as opposed to the blue dots because they're paying attention to these new prices and they will demand more of input one when the price of input one goes down, but they'll still have a best angle of attack to keep their business running and minimizing their cost. They have to constantly look at these prices of their inputs, prices of their output, and keep adjusting their their strategy to stay in business. Now, if we talk about this model of how the firm has to run its business, who does it need to consult for knowing this, and where is it going to get the data from? What I want to point out is that these blue curves come from their technical engineer. The blue relationships of inputs and outputs have a lot to do with how the factory floor works. So the engineer knows the various combinations of inputs that make the production line keep keep running. The red lines, the ISO cost lines, well, that's where the accountant comes in. The accountant says, well, this is the price of input one, price of input two, price of input three. Later on, the economist might come on board as a consultant to talk about expansion, the total cost curve, the average cost curve, the marginal cost curve. Now, if you come on board one of these firms as the economist, certainly if you come on as the health economist, you will be primed to ask, is this firm in the health economy actually trying to minimize costs or maximize profits? As you know, the many firms are nonprofit firms and they don't want to maximize profits. And physicians as firms may not behave as profit maximizers. So now let's start practicing our health economics. I wanted to show you some potential data that you might see if you started to look at a physician practice. On the horizontal line, we're looking at the hours of physician time that are being used in a week of this practice. On the vertical line, I'm showing you the hours of the nurse practitioner's time that are being used in, in a given observation of the practice. Well, let's say this is a day of the practice. And every time we take an observation, we will record how many units, how many hours of doctor time, how many hours of practitioner time, and we will also write down the number of patients that they see and what it costs to buy that time. So let's start looking here. This bottom X towards the horizontal axis has a lot of doctor time and very little bit of nurse practitioner time. And because of their various wage scales, that point's going to cost $300. And we look at that combination and we see, suppose, 12 patients get seen on the day when we use that much doctor time and that little nurse practitioner time. When we write it down, we say, oh, this is interesting. We plot it on the curve. Let's take another reading on another day. We'll try a different combination. We'll try less doctor time and more nurse practitioner time. And on this day, we see it's going to cost $300. We've used less doctor time, more nurse practitioner time, still $300. We saw five patients. Well, that doesn't seem to be a step of progress. But we try again, and at this point, by adding a little bit more nurse practitioner time, we see 15 patients, we've cut down our doctor time, and the cost is $300. We could keep going. We could say, well, let's look over here. We have less nurse, ta nurse practitioner time and less doctor time, and we can see 10 patients. And we try again. We try 
even less nurse practitioner time and even less doctor time. It's $100 and we can see five patients. And filling it out some more, supposing we have more nurse practitioner time, less doctor time, we see five patients, but it costs 120 And over here, $400, because we used a lot of doctor time and a little nurse practitioner time, there's 15 patients. So this is a mess of data. You could imagine spending a long time trying to figure out, how do I give this physician firm advice here? Well, if I start to tabulate it all, I would begin to make a table of my data and writing all of these numbers down. I see at the X's, all of the data is now put into the grid. I've observed it's possible to spend $120 and make five visits, $300 and make five, $300 and make 12, blah, blah, blah. At the blue circles, that was kind of interesting. These are $100 to see five patients, $200 to see 10, $300 to see 15. Uh, I can see something going on here. At those blue dots, I get a $20 per visit minimum. Those are special points. I've drawn them specially with blue circles to call them to your attention, but they're very interesting points. They are my, my cost minimizing points. Let me try to work some harder to bring order to this raw data. One thing I can notice is that <coughs> There's a $300 point down here at the bottom. There's a $300 cost point in the middle. And there's another $300 point up here. And so I could join those $300 points um, here with the $300 ISO cost curve. And I could join the $200 point with an ISO cost curve. And I can join the $100 point with an ISO cost curve. After I've seen lots and lots of these points, I might get a sense that there actually is an ISO product curve or a set of ISO product curves, and here they are. These points are all the output of five points. There was a $120 one over here, and there was a $300 one over here, and there was a $100 one over here. These are all of my ISO product curves. And so you can see in the end, after I've done this again and again, I could use the theory of the firm in order to help give advice to this firm on the blue dots being the cost minimizing collection of dots that will help this firm minimize its cost per patient seen and compete if other firms are also trying to, to combine inputs to minimize the cost. So the assumptions I have to make is that we've got a, a nice smooth cost curve which can allow us to guide the firm into making choices. Like a smooth cost curve. The choices that were required don't change the production function or the budget line. All the firm had to do was pick the points on the budget lines and on the, the blue ISO product curves that were given to them by the nature of their industry and the, the nature of their market. If the firms maximize their profits, they will minimize the cost of producing output, and there will be a minimum cost function that is defined. That minimum cost function lives only at the blue dots. It doesn't live at the X's. Only on the blue dots in this model, there actually is a relationship between the cost of doing something and the total output and the prices. And if we have that type of curve, we could use it to make predictions and tell people important things. What I would love to do as an economist working for any firm is to tell my firm, firm, you will have a cost function that is a combination of your output Y and your prices W, and I know exactly what these parameters B1 and B2 are. B1 is the marginal cost to make one more unit. If you increase your output by one more Y, you will require uh, B1 more log dollars. Similarly, if the wages in your market go up by log W, B2 tells you how many more of those uh, input price dollars will get passed into your cost. So B2 connects uh, prices in your input market 
to the cost that your firm will bear because the other costs you might be able to push out into your your market of 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 your consumers so one important point is that when we say the word cost we only want to use the word cost to talk about the minimum cost there are a, an infinite number of possible ways to spend money doing anything but only the minimum cost approaches are of interest so let's supposing I decided to go into the pizza business and let me start to to make some pizza I've got my little plates I'm gonna make pizza out of some dough so I'm gonna say instead of rolling out dough in my pizza company I'm gonna use uh, preformed pizza crusts and I'm just gonna use a tortilla so I'm gonna put a tortilla uh, on my plate put one on this plate this is one tortilla but here I'm just not paying attention I'm not being very careful and I'll put five tortillas down on this plate as the crust of my pizza and then for some sauce I'm gonna take a packet of ketchup right here I've got my Heinz ketchup and I open it up and I'm gonna pour my my tomato sauce on the five pieces of dough put up some sauce here you can see it making some some really raunchy pizza and for this one I forget it I don't care I'll just there that's my my sauce on that one we're gonna spread this one around and I'm being very careless and sloppy I'm not paying attention to whether the market will buy this pizza or not I'm just doing something because I can it's a free country and I'll take some some cheese here you can see my my Romano cheese let me spread that on top of my pizza this is gross but I'm making the point that nature is full of people who are not trying to win in the pizza business so here I've got a pizza with five pieces of dough some ketchup and some Parmesan cheese and here I've got a pizza with one piece of dough a little sprinkle of ketchup in the middle and way too much cheese now I could go and publish a study and I said well it costs this much uh, four cents to make this pizza on the right and because I overdid it on the tortillas it cost me 20 cents to make the pizza on the left and so hey world the cost of making pizza is some average of 20 cents and four cents the point is you don't care about my stupid pizza shop my pizzas are gross disgusting and what I spent to make them is of no interest to anybody I am NOT in the pizza business obviously no one's gonna buy my pizza so you don't care what it costs me to make them that's the point you only want to understand the cost of a cost minimizing competitive firm in the pizza industry that is minimizing costs and maximizing profit when you say it costs you want to give guidance to potential sellers and buyers so you want to control for the quality of the pizza never pay attention to lousy pizza factories that make disgusting gross pizza only pay attention to people that are doing an attempt to, to stay in the industry and compete you also have to make sure that I'm trying to minimize cost which I wasn't I was doing really stupid things to my pizzas and using the wrong types of ingredients so don't study the cost that I was spending on this failed pizza business and do study individuals that are trying their best to to try to minimize costs and maximize profits or to optimize something back in the health field we will find that many of our providers are working for nonprofits and they are not trying to maximize profits but we have to find out what they're trying to do to give them helpful advice so we can collect data that look like what did factory one spend on cost what was its output what were its prices factory two what were the costs what was the output and what were the prices we can use our theory to try to fit an equation but if one or more of these factories is not trying to minimize costs and wanting to minimize something else or maximize something else we should know that in order to give that factory good advice so now in the health economy the fact is that physicians do not only want to maximize profit they want to maximize profit as well as maximize their enjoyment of life using their leisure time and they want to maximize some component of patient outcomes 
they are internally trading off the utility function of these three things. All three things are good. They want money, they want leisure time, and they want their patients to have better health. But they don't want only one of these three things. And there are trade-offs. Again, obviously there's a trade-off between how much money the doctor can make and how much leisure she can have. There's also a trade-off between how much leisure she can have and how healthy her patients are. If she wants her patients to have the best outcomes, she might give up her weekends and nights and work harder to do more for them, call them up at, at, uh, in the evening, often offer her email time. There's so much that a physician could do that might lower the profits, lower the leisure, and increase them. So all three of these things are in competition. And doctors vary in how much they value these three things. Some are going to have heavy weight on profit, heavy on leisure, like the, the dermatologists maybe, uh, and some are going to be extremely altruistic and give up their leisure and their profit for patient outcomes. So we can actually test theories like this. We can see if physicians are maximizing profits in spite uh, of the impact on leisure and patient outcomes. Or we can see if physicians are sacrificing profits, giving up and not minimizing costs because they want to accomplish one of these other three things. So because physicians are maximizing something besides only profit, they may not minimize costs the way an ordinary firm does. They may work for a nonprofit that says what matters more is the quality of care, let's say. So the physicians that we observe in reality will be maximizing some combination of profits and leisure and patient health. I'm going to start to, to give you examples of how we see this happening. First example comes from clinics in Uganda. Here is a cost curve showing the relationship between the log of annual costs for under five children. These are various clinics seen throughout Uganda. And on a log scale, uh, the clinic seeing only 4.5 log children is costing eight log dollars uh, per, per unit. And as they see more and more children, that costs them more log dollars per unit. There seems to be a positive relationship overall between the number of children seen annually. As that goes up, the total cost goes up. And this is expected. There is a little bit of a dip though, and the other thing that I want you to see is that underneath all of these clinics is the best performing total cost curve. It is possible in Uganda to see this many children, let's say 5.8 log children, at a cost of $6 per, per unit. So this is a, a leading area. Also in Uganda, it's possible to be a firm that doesn't do cost minimization and spends 10 log dollars per unit. So there are many firms in our data that do not perform at the frontier, which I've gathered together by this, this curve. The higher points on the curve, the ones that don't make it to the frontier, maybe they're just inefficient, maybe they're higher quality. I'll give them the benefit of the doubt until we get the data. The first thing to do is to find these points on the curve and say, well, how are you doing it? Are you skimping on quality? Are you doing efficient things? I would collect qualitative data. I would interview the workers at these firms to try to determine whether or not they have applied a superior production technology. But the point is they are not many of them are very, very far away from the, the frontier of best practices. Let me give you another example of a failure to optimize. Important study by Princeton economist Uwe Reinhardt back in the 1970s in New Jersey, he collected the type of isoquant, iso uh, cost curve that you would see. He got data on the number of visits, data on the doctor's hours, nursing aid hours, and capital. And he estimated the production function. He plotted the iso product lines. And he determined that they were hiring too few nurses aides per practice. 
the cost-minimizing number of aids per pediatrician's practice was four. However, the in practice, most New Jersey pediatricians were only hiring two nursing aides. What's the explanation? If you think about a pediatric practice, pediatricians spend a lot of the time of, of a typical visit vaccinating the child. Because you can train a nurse's aide to give the shots, you could speed through production if you have all of the immunizations and all of the counseling and consenting and, and vaccinating operation farmed out to the nursing aide. And yet it seems as though pediatricians were so interested in controlling and participating in the actual counseling of what would be the side effects, what would be the indications, and the drawing up of the vaccine and the injection of the vaccine. They wanted to do it themselves, even though it lowered their profits and made them cost more. They were giving up profit and actually giving up leisure because they believed that by themselves personally participating in the vaccination procedures, they were giving their the children in their practice a better outcome. Another in, uh, example here of a failure to optimize. Well, fair prices would be really important if we did want to see minimum cost. And one of the things that we saw in part one of this lecture was that procedures are overvalued and thinking is undervalued. And because of this, the entire country cannot optimize the balance of physician time because we're paying a lot for the proceduralists and paying too low for the thinking. So we're going to get the wrong mix of thinking and doing in healthcare. We're going to see a lot more people getting procedures and biopsies and less uh, inputs in the form of, of thinking and deciding what to do using cognitive procedures. To correct this policy problem, the U.S. government commissioned a new way of paying doctors called the Resource-Based Relative Value System, the RBRVS. This was explicitly designed to try to correct the pay disparity that you saw at the beginning of, of this lecture in Part A, where the cognitive specialists, internists, and psychiatrists got paid less than the surgeons and people who could do endoscopy. So in the 1980s, the internists and psychiatrist societies and pediatricians, all of the, the, the specialists who were much more likely to, to think rather than do a procedure, complained and got reform done. So Professor William Shaw at Harvard School of Public Health was commissioned to do this immense task of measuring the relative value units inside everything that a physician might bill for. So everything on the, the, the procedure uh, playbook of doctors, there's something called the current procedural terminology book called the CPT book that is tied to fees, Professor Shao's group had to add to what the fees were and what the procedure was an RVU, which is a balance of the amount of, of work, mental work or physical work, the amount of malpractice risk, and the amount of practice expense. What the Harvard team did was talk to doctors and ask them, so if you take out an appendix, how much real mental and physical work is it? How much malpractice risk is it? How much practice expense? They would ask a psychiatrist, when you see a depressed person for 20 minutes, how much work? How much malpractice? How much practice expense? When um, an internist goes and treats pneumonia in their office, blah, 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 again and again, etc., etc. Professor Shao's team made thousands of these RVU calculations based on interviews with doctors in these various specialties. And at the end, he had this table of RVUs, and the U.S. government adopted the RBRVS payment system. So now, when a doctor submits a fee for service A, they get a base fee of dollars per hour, let's say $100 per hour, but they get a bump up or a bump down based upon the relative value units attributed to that procedure. So if it was a high RVU procedure, that RVU multiplies the base fee and the doctor gets more money for it. So let's say an appendectomy is an RVU of two 
and you spend an hour doing an appendectomy, you get $200. If you are doing something that is easy, let's say you are giving somebody counseling on uh, diaper rash, and your RVU is 0.5, you spend an hour counseling for diaper rash, you get an RVU of $50 as a final fee. So the, the resource-based relative value system was a way to try to fix the disparity. It hasn't really worked completely. It hasn't worked much. As you saw at the beginning of this lecture, there are tremendous disparities in annual earnings between the primary care side of things and the proceduralist even though we're still using the resource-based relative value system. What, what basically happened is that the RVUs just simply put in stone the same bias against thinking that was already there to begin with. Supply-induced demand is a perennial hot topic in health economics. And it's hot because it really speaks to this informa information asymmetry that allows doctors to potentially drum up unnecessary business. If a health economist sees an influx of new providers into a region. It might be either A, because that region is experiencing an epidemic and is having a lot of sickness and disease, or it might be that the doctors just got greedy and they started to recommend that the patients in that region get more of their visits, more of their procedures, and use more services. Option B is only possible because of the power and the information asymmetry that allows a doctor to say, I think you need to see me, I think you need to see me again and again and again. So here is what the data might look like in one of these situations. Supposing you see a place in, in, in the world where you see point A at time one, First, the market has an intermediate price and a pretty low quantity demanded. And then you see the price go up at point B and the quantity demanded go up. And then you see at a later time, the price come down and the quantity go up. So the first story would be a story that says demand moved on its own. Story one is that the demand moved on its own, that the movement from A to B was a shift in demand from D1 to D2. After demand shifted, because of there, there was perhaps an epidemic or something that made people want to get care, maybe they got new coverage for insurance, something made them demand more and that pushed prices up to where they were at B. After demand shifted up, supply shifted in response because they saw high demand at point B, the suppliers moved in to do the appropriate thing and we reached a new equilibrium. Prices came back down to the global market equilibrium, but the quantity supplied and the quantity demanded is now higher at these new supply and demand curves S2 and D2. So that's story number one. Ordinary, there was a demand shock, supply responded. The second story is the story of supply-induced demand. In this story, demand was starting at point A. The suppliers simply started whispering and telling their patients, you need to get more. And because there was no epidemic, this is an artificial increase of demand being driven by the doctor saying you need this. So the doctors drive this demand up to B, and then after they have induced demand to move from D1 to D2, down comes the supply at S2. The problem with our theories are the data look the same for story one and story two. You see point A, point B, point C. You see these price quantity combinations at point A, point B, point C. I told one story one and said the change was because there was an epidemic. I told story two that the change was because the doctors said things to patients that made them want more services. The data points don't tell you the difference. It was the story I told that told the difference. So if an economist wants to test supply-induced demand, 
They can't look at price quantity combinations. They can't look at supply and demand curves with your eyes and say, well, I see the supply curve move. Instead, what you have to do is talk to people, listen to patients say, my doctor recommended things I didn't need in story two. In story one, you would have to hear the patient say, oh, we were suddenly wanting to buy more services because we got new insurance coverage, or we had an epidemic and so we wanted more services. It's the story that drives the theory, but the empirical look at the prices and quantities won't give you the ability to prove one way or the other the theory of supply-induced demand. So that's all I have to say about uh, our stories about physician labor supply. I'm going to stop here, and in the next section of lecture, we're going to go over nursing labor supply. So I hope to see you back in Part C.